Good morning, church. We want to welcome you to uh, Trinity Church on this Sunday morning, and we are so glad that you have chosen to be in worship with us today. Uh, my name is Grace Hahn. I'm the pastor here uh, at Trinity, and I would extend a special welcome if you um, are joining us for the first time or kind of stumbled upon us. We're so glad to be in worship with you. This morning, we are talking about love that has the power to change the future. We are looking at uh, the familiar but powerful story uh, that comes from the book of Ruth. A story about what can happen when we choose love above all else. The power of love that can save and heal a broken heart, a desperate family, and a flailing nation. This is the power of love that can change the future. We are also blessed this morning to have a testimony from the Reverend Guimond Pierre-Louis, who is an Episcopal priest uh, from Haiti. And he's going to share a few reflections about his uh, understanding and experience of love in his own life, and we are going to be incredibly blessed by his testimony. So as we continue in worship, I want to invite you uh, to join me in the call to worship, which is based off our gospel reading for today from Mark 12. Uh, the response is, this is the greatest commandment. Let us join together in the call to worship. What is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the greatest commandment. There is no commandment greater than these. This is the greatest commandment. Let us join together in our opening hymn.
together in this space, we begin by sharing in a prayer of confession and pardon that brings us into right relationship uh, before God and with one another. So I invite you to join with me in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have failed to recognize your image in our neighbor. We have failed to choose to advocate for your justice. We have failed to create community which includes all and gives to all equal access to your abundant life. Forgive us, we pray. Heal us, we pray. Friends, hear this good news. God's gift of grace in Jesus Christ forgives us and sets us free to live full human lives in community. May we go forth confident of the grace to see with new eyes beyond prejudice, to imagine with renewed fervor justice and mercy for all, and to create with a new will a community where all are given access to God's abundant life. Glory be to God. Amen. At this time, we invite you to share the peace with one another. Uh, there are a few ways that we encourage you to do that. The first is uh, we would love to know that you are worshiping with us today. Uh, there is a way to register your attendance with us. You'll see that link in your bulletin, and it will be down below in the chat feature. Uh, in that, it just lets us know that you are with us. If you have prayer requests, if you'd like to be added to our email communications, if you'd like to receive texts from us, uh, you can list those all on the registration form. Uh, the other way is we encourage you to say hello in the chat feature. Uh, this is a great way for us to interact with each other virtually, uh, and we encourage you to do that at this time. Let us pass the peace. invite the children to um, pay attention. Uh, we are going to have our children's time now and we are going to go to Mr. Jeff Miller who's going to bring us our children's time this morning. Hey everybody, it's Jeff and I'm really happy to be here with you again to do uh, children's time. Um, please bear with me today because I'm about to tell you a really kind of complicated family story um, that that comes from our readings today. Uh, it comes from the book of Ruth. Um, but it's a story I think we can all learn from and all feel a lot of uh, hope in. Um, Ruth was a lady in the Bible. She uh, lived uh, over a thousand years before Jesus was born. So that was a long time ago. Now Ruth came from a country called Moab. And Moab was close to Israel. Now, um, there was a man named Elamayak. Please forgive me if I get the pronunciations wrong. These are hard names to pronounce from the Bible. Elamayak, and he was married to a lady named Naomi. And they lived in Bethlehem. We've all heard of Bethlehem because Bethlehem's where Jesus was from, right? So uh, Elamayak and Naomi uh, lived in Bethlehem during a great famine. There was lots of famine and disease, and it was kind of sad, and people were having trouble living in Bethlehem at the time. So Elamayak and Naomi moved, and they moved to the country of Moab because they heard that in Moab they had food and there was plenty and that they could live there and raise their family. Now they had two sons. Their sons were named Machalon and Kilion. So they all lived in Moab for a while. Now sickness and destruction, Machalon and Kilion, married two women who lived in Moab. Now, now they were not Israelites. They were not Jewish, these two ladies. Their names were Ruth and Orpah. I have to laugh. Every time I see the name Orpah, I want to say Oprah because it looks like Oprah. But 
I've been practicing saying Orpah. So Ruth and Orpah. Now they were Moabites. Now Moabites didn't worship our God. Moabites had a whole different religion and they were very different. But when um, when Elamak and Naomi moved there, they were living amongst these people who were very different from them. So their sons married Ruth and Orpah. Um, and shortly thereafter, um, the father, Elamak, died. And then the two sons died. And it was very sad because that left Naomi and Ruth and, uh, I almost said Oprah again, Orpah, all alone. And in that time, uh, women had a, women really couldn't live alone. They could not earn money. They couldn't get a job. They Women had different, it was a long time ago, and women were treated very differently. They were very dependent upon a husband or sons or relatives to take care of them. Um, and so they, so here's Naomi, she's trapped in this country away from her family. And she says to her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem to be with my family. I've heard that the famine is over and we can go there and live, but I don't want you to have to come back with me to a strange country that you, you don't know. I want you to stay with your families in Moab where they can take care of you. Orpah went back with her family, but Ruth said, no, I, I'm going to go with you and take care of you. You shouldn't travel back to Bethlehem by yourself. She said, wherever you will go, I will go. So she took a big chance. Ruth went back to this strange country, went to Bethlehem. She didn't know the religion. She didn't know the people. She didn't know the language. She was from a different country, uh, and they were very poor. And they didn't have any means of, of surviving or of making a living. So this, so when you think about it, this woman who's from a different country, a different religion even, a different language, whole different kind of person that may not have been recognized at, at all by people in, in Bethlehem, someone who was poor, who had nothing, people were shunning her because she was different when she moved into Bethlehem. She showed kindness. She showed love to her mother-in-law, and she didn't have to. But that love led her to meet um, someone new that she married that ended up bringing David and then Jesus into the world. In, in a big way, Ruth's act of kindness, her love and devotion and taking care of her family led to the, our church. And that's a great example. The root that Ruth laid that grew into the tree that is our church today is pretty amazing. You know, the other story that we're going to talk about today at church uh, comes from Matthew. And in that story, it's the, it's the story of Jesus talking about what he, what is his favorite commandment. And he says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Think about that. Moab was a different country, whole different people. It was a neighboring country, but they were different. When Ruth came to Bethlehem, nobody knew who she was, but Boaz saw in her kindness and devotion, and he saw that she was a good person. He loved his neighbor as he would want to be loved. And that love allowed him to see past the differences, and it allowed him to see in her that she was a good person. And they ended up forming a family that led to Jesus and led to our church. So the root, the root of our church is about seeing what's the same about us and seeing the beauty in people that are different than us and seeing that um, we can love each other even though we're different and even though we come from different places and we can love them as ourselves because we would not be here as a church today if Ruth had not loved Naomi and if Boaz had not loved Ruth as themselves. Thank you and have a great week. I love you. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing uh, that beautiful uh, children's time. 
This morning, as we come to our time of uh, morning prayer, um, I want to direct your attention to the sympathies in our bulletin today. Uh, it's with great sadness that we share the death of Joseph Gregg, who is um, Janessa Stokes' uh, uncle, who died this week. And we want to extend our prayers and sympathies to Janessa and Hank and their uh, extended family. As we come to our time of pastoral prayer, we are going to lift up uh, petitions before God. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you are invited to respond, hear our prayers. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for the blessing and gift of being your church, especially during this time when so many of our regular plans have been placed on hold. We pray that you will continue to live in us and enliven us to live and act as your church, to love one another as you have loved us. God, we come to you this morning with humble hearts in this season of unknowing and uncertainty. As we see COVID rates going up around the country, we pray for all who have been affected by the virus, for medical professionals who put their own lives at risk to care for others, for families who have lost loved ones and grieve this loss, families who have been separated from those who love, for many who are afraid. God, we ask for your protection and your grace to surround us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray for all who have been affected in other ways, for people who have lost jobs and incomes, for families who fear getting evicted because they aren't able to make rent, for people who have had to rely on food assistance to feed their families. We pray for local businesses who may not be able to reopen and for all those who are uncertain about what comes next. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, as we look ahead to the fall, we pray for our schools, for teachers, administrators, staff, children, and families as difficult decisions are, are made about school options this fall. We pray for administrators, teachers, and staff who are feeling exhausted and burnt out. We pray for families who struggle to know how best to teach and care for their children. We pray for children who rely on school for stable meals and socialization, for children who have learning disabilities and struggle with online learning. God, we pray for your wisdom and your guidance, as, your, as well as your spirit of patience and calm to guide us today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, in the midst of unknowing and uncertainty, we pray that you will guide us to love one another as you love us. Help us to choose love above all else, even when it isn't easy or convenient. We lift up all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, <clears throat> thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
If you don't have your bulletin in front of you, um, the anthem that Carol just so beautifully sang uh, is called Ruth Song. And the lyrics that she sang are uh, come directly, much of it, right from our first scripture today, uh, from the book of Ruth, uh, chapter 1, verse 6 to 18. So you might hear some overlap in those, uh, in those verses. Here are these words from Ruth 1. When she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord had turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And I invite you, if you're able, to stand where you are uh, for the reading of the Gospel. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other and to love him with all of the heart and with all of the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, as uh, we get started, I want to start by just sharing a few announcements. Uh, first, I wanted to follow up on our Healthy Church Team announcement that was made uh, last week uh, by Bryce Benson. And I want to share with you that earlier this week, we submitted a plan to our district superintendent to start some outdoor worship services in person. And I'm happy to share with you that that plan has been approved. So our plan is that in the month of August, we're going to host uh, outdoor prayer and communion gatherings on Wednesday evenings at uh, 8 p.m. in our courtyard, which is the grassy area between the parsonage and the church. Uh, these gatherings will be in addition to, not in place of, our Sunday worships, 
uh, which will remain on my board only at this time. Uh, we're going to share a few more details with you as we get some of those things worked out. Uh, but as Bryce mentioned last week, uh, when we do meet, the gatherings will look just a little bit different. Everyone will be required to wear masks and, um, and practice social distancing. We're going to ask people to register in advance um, just so we can plan accordingly and we'll ask you to fill out um, a health uh, questionnaire. Um, we know this won't be for everyone, and I trust that you will use your best judgment about whether or not an in-person gathering is right for you at this time. Um, if you are in a high-risk uh, population, maybe it's a better decision to stay home right now, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, we want to encourage you to uh, try to make the best decision for your health and for your family's health. Um, for those of you who um, are able to meet, I do look forward to the opportunity to find some ways of connecting uh, together and uh, we will share again some of those details in the weeks ahead. Also, I want to let you know that starting uh, tomorrow, our youth are participating in a youth uh, mission. Uh, I think I shared last week that before COVID, this was the week that our youth were supposed to go away on a week-long home building project through the Appalachia Service Project, and unfortunately that trip has gotten canceled uh, because of COVID. Uh, but uh, we thought it was still important for our youth to participate in, uh, in missions. Uh, so um, Hannah, our program director, um, Ruth from Beverly Hills, and John Hobie said they've been working really hard uh, to put together a youth mission week. Um, they're going to spend every day this week in some kind of mission. Some of them will be done at home with their family. Some of them will be here uh, on site. But every afternoon this week, our youth will be actively in mission. I'm going to ask you to pray for our youth this week. We're really looking forward to what this week could look like. Um, but it's been a lot of extra work. So I want to also just give a lot of thanks to, um, to Hannah, to Donahue, to Ruth Tapp, and John Hoganson for their leadership in making this week possible. Uh, let's pray together. God, we pray that um, the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. These words from Ruth, a poor, widowed, migrant foreigner, are one of the most powerful statements of love in our scriptures. It is one that chose love above all else, that trusted in love when everything else was falling apart, that was faithful in love even despite hardship and illness and death, and believed in love when everyone else had lost hope in love. And because of Ruth's love, because of her refusal to give up on love, she saved Naomi, her beloved mother-in-law, from a life of bitterness and pain. She brought renewal and joy into this family who had lost all hope. Eventually, she became the matriarch of the Davidic line and part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Ruth, this unexpected outsider who never should have been part of this history, chose love, and that changed their future. We are in a sermon series about what love looks like. Through this series, we are exploring the healing and transformative power of love as our scriptures lay out, as Jesus lived and taught. And what we've seen over the last few weeks is that while love isn't always easy, real love takes hard work and honesty and a commitment and willingness to engage and love one another. It means facing our own implicit biases and standing up to prejudice and injustice. But this love also has the power to transform and heal people, relationships, and communities. And that's precisely what we see in our scriptures today. Today we are talking about love that has the power to change the future. Love that chooses love despite what our past tells us to do. 
Love that chooses love even when it's difficult and painful, when it's inconvenient and risky. Because when we choose that love, it has the power to change our future. And that's the love we see in our scripture from Ruth. There's much to unpack in the book of Ruth. There's so much cultural and historical baggage that comes with reading Ruth. The first chapter of Ruth starts like this. In the, di- in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. It's important to know that the time of judges was a time of moral chaos and national instability in Israel. It was widely known at the time when Israel, quote, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, the very last verse in the book of Judges says this, In those days there was no king in Israel, and all the people did what was right in their own eyes. It wasn't a great time in Israel's history. And on top of that, there was a time of famine, which meant many, including Naomi's family, were forced to migrate to survive. So Naomi and Elimelech, her husband, and their two sons went to live in the city of Moab. While they were there, their two sons married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. But within 10 years, Elimelech died, and both of their sons died, so that Naomi was left, and this is what the verse says, quote, the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Now that line is important because, as we know, during this time, a woman was recognized in only in her relationship to men. So without a husband or sons, Naomi had no financial or physical security. It was not only difficult, it was dangerous to be a widow. Because the only way to survive was to beg and rely on the charity of others. Naomi had gone from a bad situation to the worst case scenario. Everything she knew and loved was taken from her. She lost her husband, then both of her sons, and in addition to her deep grief, she was alone in a foreign land with no money and no resources. Her future didn't look great. In fact, later on in Ruth 1, when Naomi returned home to Bethlehem, Naomi told her friends to call her Mara, which means bitterness, because God had turned his back on me. Some of you might identify with Naomi today, that feeling of hopelessness and fear that turns into bitterness, a feeling completely lost and unsure of what to do next. To be honest, we may all feel a little bit like Naomi in 2020, when things have gone from bad to worse and we don't know what is coming next. And in her desperation, Naomi decided to go back home to Bethlehem, perhaps to die in her homeland. But first, she decided to set her daughter in laws free. Naomi knew that if Orpah and Ruth stayed with her, it would mean certain hardship and suffering for them, possible risk of injury and death. There was no future with Naomi, and she wanted to spare her daughters from that future. And while her daughters resisted at first, Naomi's mind was made up, and the three women wept together, and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and left. This is where the story should have ended. This is where Naomi thought her story should have ended. Her final act of love was to give her daughter-in-laws another chance at life, And so Naomi could go home to Bethlehem to face her uncertain future and to die in peace. But something happened that changed her future. Ruth refused to go. The scriptures tell us that Ruth clung to Naomi. And as Naomi tried to tell her to go, Ruth said this, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following me. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Now, it's important to know that choosing to stay with Naomi was not the smartest decision for Ruth. They were both widows, and their chances at survival were slim at best. As I said before, they would have to rely on the charity of strangers and just hope for the best. On top of that, Naomi was going back to Bethlehem, to Judah, and Ruth was a Moabite woman. 
And while the, while the Moabites and the Israelites shared a common heritage, there was a long history of conflict between the two tribes, and the Israelites often looked down upon the Moabites. And most significantly for our story today, Moabite women were often depicted as a stumbling block for Hebrew religious purity and piety. We see this prominently in other books of the Old Testament, and in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which focused heavily on purifying Israel, and cementing its ethnic identity by casting out foreign women and foreign wives and their children from the land. In fact, this was a constant tension throughout the Old Testament, which is why the book of Ruth is such an interesting one, because it clearly pushes against that narrative. And throughout the book of Ruth, Ruth is referred to as Ruth the Moabite to further emphasize that Ruth was a foreigner in this land. So Ruth knew that going back with Naomi to Bethlehem would mean that she would face prejudice and discrimination. She knew the hardships she would face. She had no blinders on about what this choice meant for her life. But despite that, despite everything around her telling her to choose otherwise, Ruth chose to stay with Naomi. She chose love. What I find so incredible about this love story is that Ruth knew full well what she was walking into. There was no naive delusion about what their life was going to be like. She knew the hardship she was walking into. She knew what she was facing, and she still chose love. I think sometimes we think choosing love means choosing the easy option, that love is somehow synonymous with happiness and a good life. And while there is certainly overlap, there is no guarantee of that with love. And I'm sure, and I know many of you know that as you've walked with loved ones through difficult times. But true love, biblical love, as we see in the story of Ruth today, is love that chooses love, not hoping that we will escape hardship, but love that chooses love with the willingness to walk through hardship together. A willingness to face our reality square on with courage and hope, as Ruth did with Naomi. And here's what happened when Ruth chose love. This love changed their future. See, Ruth's act of love fundamentally changed the trajectory of Naomi's life and this family's life. It changed their future from one of pain and bitterness into one of hope. Because Ruth refused to give up on Naomi, Ruth and Naomi went back to Bethlehem. And they survived in this new reality with nothing else to hold on to other than this powerful act of love. And by the end of the book of Ruth, the same friends whom Naomi had told her to call Mara, which means bitterness, say to her, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him a son. Ruth's act of love helped to bring healing and restoration to Naomi, who was all alone in this world, bitter and ready to give up on the world. Ruth helped Naomi to see that there was hope for a better future, and the book ends with Naomi cradling the child of Ruth and Boaz, who was named Obed, who became the father of Jesse, the father of King David. And this act of love not only saved Naomi, but changed the trajectory of the nation of Israel. While the book of Ruth began during a time of national instability and chaos, it ends with the birth of of the grandfather of King David, who became known as one of Israel's greatest kings and represented a time of a united monarch. It changed the way the Israelites understood outsiders and foreigners in God's promise. The inclusion of the book of Ruth in the Old Testament canon is no mistake. It was a powerful understanding that God's promise is ushered in not by insiders, but by unlikely outsiders. And later on in the Gospel of Matthew, Ruth is named in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So important was her act of love that it merited a place in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the author of the greatest act of love. 
That's the power of this love. Now, while this story took place thousands of years ago, in many ways, our reality today is not unlike the one Ruth and Naomi faced in our scriptures. We are living in a time of great uncertainty. We've seen crisis after crisis hit as we faced a global pandemic, as we face a racial pandemic. Many of us are struggling to figure out how to live and act best in the midst of a very uncertain future. Like Naomi, it's easy to get overwhelmed with the places of unknowing and uncertainty. It's easy to fall into bitterness and despair. When I think about what schools are going to look like in the fall, I just want to give up and cry. For all of the scenarios, they all seem impossible. When I think about the real work and commitment we need to make to ensure racial equality and real justice for all God's children, it's easy for me to feel overwhelmed or cynical about if we can really make a difference. It's easy for us to be overcome with frustration and anger and bitterness and give up on our future. But today, we also see the witness of Ruth, who chose love above all else, who chose love when it didn't make sense, when it wasn't convenient, when it was hard and difficult, without knowing how things would turn out, but chose love, trusting that it had the power to change what seemed like an impossible future. For us today, we are called to faithfully step out in that love, to choose love above all else, knowing that it won't be easy, but that it has the power to change our future. Friends, we aren't living in an easy reality. But when we choose love, it has the power to chart a path toward a better future. Let us pray together. Gracious and almighty God, <clears throat> As we confess to you the places of uncertainty in our hearts and in our lives. God, we pray that you will give us the courage of Ruth, who chose love above all else. God, give us that same courage today. Help us to choose love that has the power to change our future. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'm very blessed to welcome and introduce uh, the Reverend Guimond Pierre-Louis. Uh, Reverend Pierre-Louis is an Episcopal priest uh, from Haiti who for the last year has been studying at the Virginia Theological Seminary right here up the street. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Guimond, he has worshipped with us uh, over the course of the last year. Last summer, he was staying with the Lane Bookholtz family uh, from our church, and uh, we've been really blessed to have him become part of our church family. Uh, Guimond is returning to Haiti uh, tomorrow, and I have asked him if he would be willing to just share a few words about his own reflections and understanding of love and how it has been a guiding principle for him in his life. Uh, and he um, was um, happy to say yes, and we are just so blessed to have him bring his testimony today. So let us uh, turn over to uh, Gibbon now. With all my heart, I thank Pastor Grace and the beloved community of Trinity Methodist Church for this opportunity to share a bit of my story and experience with love, both as a concept and practice as I face different cultures and countries. I think most of you have seen me with Mary Beth, Jeff, Julian, and Elizabeth at Trinity. But to say a bit more about myself, I am an international student from Haiti. I just graduated from Virginia Theological Seminary and I'm waiting to go home soon. I grew up in the rural area of Haiti with four siblings alongside my courageous mother and father. I first learned what love is from my parents, a love I describe as giving what you don't have. By that I mean they lack in school education, but they work hard to have all their children educated. My experience with the concept 
of love originates from a divine and spiritual perspective of love. In the words, it is because I believe it is because the seed of God's love is in us that we can love in return, as it is said in First John chapter four, verse verse nineteen. We love because He first loved us. When I first came to the U.S. in 2017, I studied at Hartford Seminary in Connecticut. I was happy, but also anxious. But between these two feelings, I tried to cultivate a loving heart in order to navigate and balance my happiness and my anxiety. I came here because a priest called Denise Cabana and a Hartford Seminary faculty member, Lucinda, chose to invest their time and their resources in me. I came to study because people I didn't even know reached out to me and chose to help me. After Connecticut, I was accepted at Virginia Theological Seminary. As an international student, I saw myself as the other, the stranger, the outsider, who is studying and living in a different culture than my own. The notion of choice comes in as I integrate the place, in class, in church, with housemates, and even with people I met in the street. In meeting them, the whole majority, I need to admit, welcomed me, cared for me, looked after me, checked on me constantly, while a few were indifferent. To be realistic, that's the reality. Living in these new settings made me aware of something. I had to change. I used to be reluctant in receiving attention and love, but I have come to realize that love is not a one-way street. One needs to be willing to love and to be loved. That's the kind of love God is required from us. We give and we receive. We receive as we give. I also learned that love comes with responsibility. Yes, it comes with the kind of choices I make. I remember one of my roommates was a little slow in her movements. When I helped her move uh, something or carry something, she always felt guilty because she slowed me down. But as someone who is always in a hurry, I always told her how fortunate I was to be slowed down for a good cause. I take the responsibility to, to, to make someone feel happy the same way I find countless people who make me happy every day. I take the, responsib the responsibility to build relationships and learn rather than protect, uh, rather than protecting my own comfort zone. Like Ekna Iswanan writes, to love is to be responsible in everything. The work we do, the things we buy, the food we eat, the people we look up to, the movies we see, the words we use, every choice we make from, mon from morning to night. That is the real measure of love. It is a wonderfully demanding responsibility. Thus, to love deeply is to be fully responsible. And this is why society around the globe are, uh, some, are dysfunctional. Responsibility is not being taught and a practical notion of love is missing. In the current climate, the whole world, not just the U.S., is living in, I find it necessary to review and reassess my notion of relationship and friendship. During my experience in the U.S., I will never be able to tell you just how fortunate I am to have met incredible people. To honor a few, I mentioned uh, the Lane family in the beginning, my friends in Connecticut, my friend Larry with whom I am staying today, and countless others. But also, I will never be able to say how much I have learned 
from people with whom I disagree or people who see things differently from me. There lies what I would call the promise of love as something we are working with all kinds of with all kinds of people to achieve. And by that I have come I have come to realize that to love is to learn how to disagree agreeably, to learn how to have a conversation even though we have different viewpoints. In the Washington Post newspaper one day last week, I saw an article which said we are all starved for hope. In the same way, I realized we are not really starving for love because we do love people we choose to love. But our societies are probably starving for a type of love that is wide enough to encompass the other, the stranger, those who are different. I have experienced both narrow love and wide love. I am thankful as I learned from both of them. And I believe it is by doing this that my notion and our notion of love and my practice and our practice of love will continue to inform us and be a wind behind our back. Amen. Thank you, uh, Reverend Pierre for sharing those beautiful and powerful words. We are going to be praying for you, uh, for how God is calling you next. Uh, we thank you for, uh, we thank God for the ways that our journeys have crossed paths, and we look forward to seeing how God is moving in you next. As we continue in our worship uh, today, we come to the time in our worship where we give back a portion of the gifts that God has placed in our hearts by the giving of our tithes and offerings. As always, we want to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, uh, to consider giving online. There is a giving tab right there on our website. You can also give by text, and those instructions are in our um, bulletin, and it's in the chat feature below. Um, after, I'm going to just leave a few seconds for us to give our tithes and offerings, or if you've already done that, to say a prayer, and then I will lead us in an offertory prayer. Let us give our tithes and offerings.
We want to remind you that immediately following the service, we're going to have a time of fellowship over Zoom, and we'd love to invite you to join us uh, for that time. Receive now this benediction. God, may we go forth from this place to choose this love, this love that has the power to change our future. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.